God is able to do right now. Amen. Amen. We thank God for all the testimonies and the song service and the prayers that came for this what prayer meeting is about. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. The Father, we come in the name of Jesus. Father, you've been so good to us. Brought us from the rocking of our cradle up until this now and praying hour. Thank you, Lord. Father, we thank you for the manifold blessings that you've given us. Father, I pray that you continue to allow your spirit to dwell in this place and to dwell in us. Bless your word, Father. Let us give the instruction as you would have us to give tonight. And let those receive your word. Let it be planted in their hearts, Father, and that they will remember what was spoken on tonight. These and other blessings we ask in the son Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Come on, give God a hand clap of praise. Amen. 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 See, I, I'm, I'm glad Deke did sing that song because I, I couldn't have pulled out in the night. <laughs> Amen. We thank God for everybody in the house today, um, tonight. I'm just excited about Revelations. All right. Yes. Just excited about Revelations. And, and, I, and there's, there's so much stuff I, I read too fast when we were starting on it the first time. And now, if, if, if you're not in a hurry, you'd like to take our time uh-huh. in discussing what, what John saw mm-hmm. and what he, what he has for us, amen, as a church, mm-hmm. amen. We went over verses one through eight last week and discussed where John was, what he saw, uh-huh. discussed Jesus' introduction and now we're going to go a little deeper into that, into that first chapter. We're going to start at verse 9. And we're going to see how far I, I've outlined to go um, to have five verses discussed tonight. And we're going to try to get those five verses. But there's so much stuff in verse number 9. Amen. So much stuff in verse number 9. Revelations, first chapter, verse 9 says, I, John who also am your brother and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ was in the isle that is called Patmos for the word of God and for the testimony of Christ, of Jesus Christ. Amen. When John says that I am your brother, and companion in tribulation and in the kingdom and patience of Jesus Christ, John here is talking to the church or talking to those churches in which he was writing to. John had some characteristics that were that were common, that he had in common with those seven churches in Asia. There were some things that they had alike. There were four characteristics that they had alike. The first thing was of their persecution for their faith. Amen. Christians were being persecuted at the time. Amen. They were being persecuted at the time. If they found anybody in that way, you could be killed or thrown into prison. Amen. So these churches were suffering the same thing. That's the first thing, persecution of their faith. The second thing, membership in the redeemed community over which Christ served as Lord and King. They were all a member of Christ's church or the church of Jesus Christ, that church in which he, upon this rock, I will build my church. Amen. No denomination. It wasn't Baptist and Methodist and Catholic and Episcopalian and all this stuff. It was just his church. Amen. It was just his church. That's the second thing that he had in common with those churches. The third thing was the eager anticipation of the glory of his coming of the coming millennial reign on earth. All of them were sitting and waiting for Jesus to come back. Because all of them felt that Christ would come back at any day. 
Paul lived his life every day as Jesus could come in the next hour. Boy, what a world it would be if we lived our lives if we felt that Jesus was going to come in the next hour. <laughs> Amen. And the thing about it, the scary thing about it, he can if he wanted to. So why do we play Russian roulette with our soul? Uh, uh, let, let me go ahead on with this. A amen. The, the four, I said there were four things. There were four things he had in common. The, the, the fourth thing is endurance and perseverance in spite of difficult times. In other words, he did not give up the faith because times got hard. We have a lot of people who fall away from the church because times get hard. Because, because they've been lied to for so long that once you come to Jesus, everything gonna be all right. You're gonna slide on in on flowery beds of ease, but the devil is alive. Because sometimes your trouble don't start until you come to Jesus. Amen. Because when I was out there in the world, I ain't have no worries and no care because I was doing what I wanted to. But then when I came to Jesus and found out these things are not of Christ, Time start getting difficult for me. Right. <laughs> Amen. Amen. So he had these characteristics with the churches that he was writing to, but he wanted to let them know that, look, I am your brother. I am your companion in this. I'm not writing. I'm not writing this sitting in my mansion and and, and sipping pina coladas and all this stuff. I'm writing you this, letting you know I'm going through all so. A amen. Amen. So now he said he was on the Isle of Patmos. I'm on the island called Patmos, and this is located in the Aegean Sea. It's off the coast of Asia Minor, which is modern day Turkey. It's a, it's a barren, rocky, crescent shaped island that's about 10 miles long and about six miles at its widest point. The Isle of Patmos was set up by the Romans to be a penal colony which means you have prisoners and, 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 and no goods <laughs> that they would send to this island to, to exile them from the rest of civilization. And now John has been sent here to the Isle of Patmos for a couple of reasons, and we're going to get into those couple of reasons why he was sent. But now John is sent here on this island seemingly all by, his, by himself to dwell alone as his punishment. Right. Amen. As a punishment. But, but, but we're going to go on. John is truly anointed by Jesus Christ. He explains that believers in Christ then and now will have tribulation. We are going to go through some things, people. I don't care who you are, how anointed you may think you are. You are going to go through some suffering. You are going to have some tribulation. A -a Amen. A and when we have tribulation, tribulation are the things that make us strong. Amen. You can't get stronger without going through some things. I, I, I like when um, in lifting weights, when in lifting weights, you will not get any stronger if you play around with the little fly weights and stuff. You will never get stronger. In order to get stronger, there has to be more resistance. And as a Christian, in order to get stronger, there has to be more resistance. So tribulations make us stronger. Amen? Also to see if it, God will also allow us to go into tribulations and put us in stressful situations to see if we will still believe. Sometimes God will test our faith. Yes. I wish I had some help in here. Sometimes God will test your faith. He will allow things to come your way to see if he can, see if he can trust you <laughs> with a bigger blessing that's coming along. Because sometimes God finds out, or God already knows, sometimes when we are under stress and strain and tribulation, we fall out, we throw in the towel, we give up. But God wants to see sometimes if they can handle what I put on them. See, there's nothing that God can put on us 
that with him we can't handle. Come on. Amen. By ourselves, yes, there's some stuff that God will allow to come on us that we can't handle by ourselves. But with God, we can handle all things. Amen. 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 The message that the church is giving today, this health and wealth thing. You come to Jesus, you're going to get rich. You're not going to get sick. You're going to get sick every now and then. I don't care what your title is. You're going to get sick every now and then. You're going to have trouble every now and then. Sometimes bills are going to get hard to pay every now and then. Folks are going to lie on you and talk about you and scandalize your name every now and then. I don't care how good you try to live, somebody ain't going to like you. Amen. In the Old and the New Testaments, people of God had had to stand amidst tribulations and trials. They've had to go through some stuff. Moses, David, Abraham, all of them, they had to go through some stuff. <coughs> and if they had to go through some stuff, guess what? We're going to have to go through some stuff. Amen. Problems are going to come to all. Paul says in Romans <coughs> 5 and 3, Paul says, and not only so, but we glory in tribulations also, knowing that tribulations worketh patience. David says in Psalm 34 and 19, many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord, somebody say, but the Lord, but the Lord. delivers him out of them all. Somebody might be saying, well, if we go through tribulations and the world go through tribulation." <clears throat> That's why I couldn't sing. <clears throat> if we go through tribulations and the world go through tribulations, what is the difference? The difference is the way that we handle the problems that we go through. Because the church should not handle the problems like the world. We have Jesus. Amen. We have a defense and we have a fortress that will fight for us. Amen. A amen. So John <coughs> on the Isle of Patmos was not trying to impress anybody with how spiritual he was. There was nobody there to try to impress. You know, we have folks in church who try to impress folks who show them how, how spiritual they are. You know, folks, you can, you can sit around and watch, <laughs> Bishop, you can sit around and watch them. They, they like to make the faces like, ooh, ooh. <laughs> Sometimes I wonder, what in the world are you feeling? <laughs> what's, 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 what's wrong? Ooh, ooh. They, uh. they, they impress, they try to impress folks to show them how spiritual they are. But John wasn't there, that wasn't his job. He was there on the Isle of Patmos all by himself and there were two reasons why he was there on the Isle of Patmos. Two reasons. The first reason is because the authorities put him there because he was preaching the gospel. That's the first reason. He was there because they told him not to preach the gospel but he was preaching about that man named Jesus. And they said, if you want to preach, you preach all by yourself. But we're going to make it where you won't be preaching to anybody. So they put him on the Isle of Patmos as a punishment. But the second reason is, what they did for a punishment, God did for a purpose. <laughs> Amen. They put John on the island as a punishment, but God put him there for a purpose. Amen. God's purpose for John being on the island was to receive the word of God and for the testimony of Jesus Christ. This is why God separated him. And sometimes it's the will of God that we go through some stuff so we'll be in, put in the position where God can then talk to us. Yeah. Because some of us have so much, so, much, so much stuff going on around us in our daily lives, in our daily routines and stuff. Sometimes God has to lay us on our backs before we'll hear what God has to say. Boy, I wish I had some help up in here. Amen. Amen. John, John 
was there on the Isle of Patmos to hear what God has to say. The enemy planned evil for John to stay here, but God turned something bad into something wonderful for all time. John could truly say in the words of Joseph, you, you thought evil against me, but God meant it unto good. A amen. And Paul says, and we know that all things work together for good to them that love the Lord, to them who are the called according to his purpose. Amen. There were reasons why. And God's reason overshadowed anything that the enemy had against John here. Amen. Because when John was on this island, just think, John was by himself. Nobody was there, but John was patient. Some of us put on an island by ourselves, isolated from everybody, we would have lost our minds. But Christ had given John his patience. Amen. He had the patience of Christ. And this was not a time of despair. He found this a great time to be with Jesus with no interruptions. Amen. And as I told you last week, sometimes God get us alone before he can reveal himself to us. And as we read in the Bible, there are several folks who had to get into exile or go into exile before they can hear what God has to say. When we look at when we look at Jacob. When Jacob had stolen the birthright from Esau, he had to get into exile. He found himself in Bethel when God had to come and talk with him. When he saw the ladder going up and down and angels going up and down. And then God had to tell him who he was and reassure him of the promises that he had made with Abraham and Isaac. But he had to get into exile. Amen. Moses had to get into exile out there with the sheep on the backside of the mountain when he looked up and he saw the burning bush. And then he went to see this burning bush. And then the voice of God came out of the burning bush and said, Moses, take off your shoes for the ground that you walk on. is holy. But he would not have said he would not have heard it if he was not in exile. Amen. Elijah had to get into exile after he had killed the 450 prophets of Baal and he ran because he heard that Jezebel was going to kill him. So he ran and, and he told his servant, the servant went with him, he told his servant to stay right here. I'm going on a little further. And then God found him in a cave. God came and said, what are you doing in here, boy? <laughs> God, they're going to take my life. He said, no, 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 they ain't going to take your life. Come and come in here. I want to show you something. God got him in the cliff of the rock. The Bible said, God said, I'm going to show you something. And then, then, then the wind came. And then there was an earthquake that came. And then the fire came. But God wasn't in all three of them. But then there was a still, small voice. <laughs> And God was in that still, small voice. But the point is, every now and then, we have to be put in isolation and we have to exile ourselves from society in order to hear what the Lord has for us. A amen? Amen. Look at that 10th verse. Any questions on that 9th verse? Look at that 10th verse. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day. And heard behind me a great voice as of a trumpet. Note here that John said that he was in the spirit. He was in the spirit. Notice spirit is capitalized here. Which signifies he was not in his own spirit. But he was caught up in the Holy Spirit of God. When he said that he was in the spirit, it indicates that he was totally consumed with the Holy Spirit. Amen. And there was, no, there was no question about whose voice that he heard behind him. Because when the Lord returns, as Paul wrote in the book of Thessalonica, that, it, that this trumpet is going to sound, it's going to sound so loud that it's going to wake up the dead. It's going to be the voice of Jesus crying out. A amen. Amen. When the Lord returns, it's actually a voice. It will be his voice, which is like a trumpet. God's voice is so loud and so horrifying that it scares the people of God if they're not in the right frame of mind. In the book of Exodus, when the Bible says that when Moses would go on the mountain and see God and talk with God, 
When he came down, the people of God, those men said, Moses, we're men just like you. I think that we need to talk to God also. Let, let God, we, we can talk to God also. So let God talk to us. We, 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 we know that you're saying this and you're saying that, but let us talk to God also. <laughs> Moses went up there and told God what they said. God said, all right, tell them, tell them in three days. <laughs> I, want them to, I want them to come right here in front of the mountain. And I want to, I'm going to talk to them. Tell them to sanctify themselves. Tell them to get right. Because I want them to really hear what I have to say. And boy, that third day when they got there, and boy, they heard the thunder, and they saw the lightning, they saw the smoke in the mountain. They said, quick, Moses, no, tell God, we, we'll listen to you. You don't have to talk to us. A -a Amen. But God does talk. God does talk. John heard this great voice behind him as of a trumpet. Amen. And when we look at this, when we look at this, and we hear what John's saying, John's saying, I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. John was not dreaming. He was not in a trance. He was in the spirit on the Lord's day. Now, when it said that he was in the spirit on the Lord's day, John was supernaturally transported out of the material world, still awake. John visualized or he saw these visions while he was awake and not dreaming. Mm. A amen. The Holy Spirit empowered his senses to perceive revelation from God. Now, this is so similar to Ezekiel 37. Bible says, Ezekiel said, you know, I was just chilling, but the hand of the Lord was upon me. Uh -huh. yes, sir. Amen. And he took me out in the spirit and set me down in a valley that was full of bones. Amen. And he caused me to pass by around, pass by about them or around them. And, and, and when he looked at them, he said, now the bones were very dry. And then God spoke to him and he said unto me, son of man, can these bones live? So similar to this experience that this, this experience that John is seeing here. But Ezekiel was shown more of a vision, even though he was taken there. But John is here in person. God is showing him this in person, not a vision. Showing him this in person. He was saying I was in the spirit on the Lord's day. The Lord's day refers to the day in which Jesus rose or Jesus was resurrected, which is Sunday. The first day of the week. And that's why we come to church on Sunday. Folks will say, no, you need to have church on the Sabbath day. Orthodox Jews have church on the Sabbath day. But in the New Testament church, church was held on the first day of the week, which is Sunday. A Amen. Amen. There was a great voice throughout Revelations. A loud sound or voice indicates the solemnity of what God is about to do. When there's a loud voice being, being mentioned in the book of Revelation, that's saying that God is about to do something. God's about to do something or God is about to show you something. A amen. Now, what did this great voice say? He said that he, he was in the spirit and he heard behind him a great voice as of a, as of a trumpet. What did this great voice say? Look at verse 11. It said, this voice said, I am Alpha and Omega. The first and the last. What thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia. Unto Ephesus and unto Smyrna and unto Pergamos, and unto Thyatira, and unto Sardis, and unto Philadelphia, and unto Laodicea. When John was beginning, he was going to bow down and worship Jesus. He was going to bow down and worship what, what the Lord was doing for him on that island. All of a sudden, this voice came up behind him. 
voice came up behind him saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. Amen. In verse 8, he said that I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And we know that Alpha and Omega, Alpha is the first letter of the Greek alphabet. Omega is the last letter of the Greek alphabet. Jesus is saying that I'm everything. I'm all in all. A Amen. Amen. Christ was describing himself as being the eternal, complete revelation of God, and he was commanding John to write what he see in a book to be preserved for the church. Whatever you see, whatever you hear, write it down. Write it down. And when he was telling them to write it in the book, the book was a scroll. Amen. They didn't have books like we have with pages here. It was a scroll in which you, um, um, some of you studied, you've heard of the, um, the Dead Sea Scrolls, where they would find books of the Bible, and, but they were written on scrolls. Now, these churches were not physically very far from the Isle of Patmos where John was, but John, so John was very familiar with these churches. He would be released from the Isle of Patmos, amen, by Emperor Nerva. The Roman emperor, he, I think he was, he was A.D. 96 through 98. I think he reigned for three years. He released John from the Isle of Patmos. John had the opportunity to bring these or to carry these letters to these churches. Now watch this. These churches right here were not chosen by John, but they were chosen by Jesus. Jesus chose them. And the purpose in sending these messages to the churches is so that they can see their error and change. God was telling John, I want you to write to these churches to let them know that I see what you're doing. In hopes that they would change. Mm. That's why certain preachers can't preach in certain churches. Because folks don't want to hear that they got to change. <laughs> they they want to hear that w the way I'm living and what I'm doing, it's all right. And God will accept me as I am. The devil is a lie. God ain't going to accept you as you are. That's why Jesus told Nicodemus, you must be born again. And if God will accept you as you are, Jesus would not have told Nicodemus, you got to start all over. You got to become something different. You got to be something new. And so John, God was, Jesus was telling John, I'm tell, I want you to write these letters to the churches to let them know I see what they're doing and I'm giving them an opportunity to straighten up. And folks, that's what preaching is supposed to be today. To tell us how Jesus loved us, died for us, and then give the word he wants you to straighten up and he's giving you a chance to do it. Thank you. A amen, somebody. Amen. amen. John told me to write it down. And you have to remember, John would write down what he saw and what he heard. Now, now get this, and sometimes it's difficult for us to recognize what John was describing. That's why the book of Revelations have so many symbols in it, because some of the stuff that John was writing about or trying to describe, he had never seen it before. Think about it, think about it. If God showed John a helicopter or an airplane, he had never seen anything like that before, how would it look when he written, wrote, writing it down and describing it? <laughs> when, when, when Ezekiel saw, saw, saw the vision and he saw, he saw God, he said he saw a wheel in the middle of a wheel. He had never seen anything like that before. But all we can do is go by his description and see a wheel in the middle of a wheel. So Jesus now is giving John his instructions. Whatever you see, I want you to write down in a book. I want you to write down in a book. A amen. So when he heard his voice, he heard his voice. Revelation 12 said, and I turned to see the voice that spake with me. 
And being turned, I saw seven golden candlesticks. I saw seven golden candlesticks. John turned around to see where the voice was coming from and said that he saw seven golden candlesticks. Now I want you to get this. He saw seven golden candlesticks. He did not see, he did not see a candlestick with the seven flutes coming out of them called the menorah. And you know, when you see a Hanukkah, uh, on television you see the menorah where they have oil in it and they have like seven flutes or seven candles coming up that's called the menorah he did not see this he saw a candlestick that was individually standing by itself from all the rest of them he saw seven candlesticks are y'all with me amen he saw seven candlesticks now he don't want you to he don't, he don't want you to just concentrate on the candlesticks but he wants us to concentrate on the one causing the candlesticks to be there. Amen. One thing we see by the seven separate candlesticks is that there is light enough for each of these churches. Each church will have their own light. Now, one thing about this, when we, we're going to find out, or we're going to, it's going to get told to us that these seven candlesticks stand for the seven churches that it was the right to. All of these candlesticks were lit. All of them had a light, which shows that although a lot of the, most of them were in error, they still had Jesus in them. <laughs> Just like today, there's a lot of mess going on in churches, but that doesn't mean that Jesus is not in it. Oh man. <laughs> Amen. If it's set up, dedicated, committed, and established to Jesus Christ, remember what Jesus told Peter. He said, Upon this rock I'll build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. But he did not say that it won't come against it. He just said that they will not prevail. So seeing that these candlesticks still had light shows that they still had hope because Jesus was in them. And oh boy. Amen, amen, amen. Now when we look at the gold, when we look at the gold, the golden candlesticks, this stands for the presence of God. Gold always represents the purity of God. So they were golden candlesticks showing that God has established these churches. God was still in these churches. Now the candlesticks, these were portable gold lampstands that, that held small oil lamps and each lampstand represented a church. And we'll find this out in verse 20. When it's going to say the mystery of the candlestick, and it's going to say that it represented the seven churches. Now notice, we're still dealing with the number seven, which is the number, the Hebrew number for completeness. Amen. And so these seven lampstands are representative of all the churches, which shows that the things that are going on in these churches will encompass every church from then on. There's some stuff that's going to be found in every church that's found in these seven churches that Jesus picked out. Amen. Look at verse 13. We, we gonna, we, we gonna, we're going to do verse 13 and then we'll stop. And in the midst of the seven candlesticks, one like unto the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the foot, and gird about the paps with a golden girdle. In the midst of the seven candlesticks, the candlesticks were all around, and then there's somebody standing in the middle of them, <laughs> surrounded by the seven candlesticks. In the midst, in the middle of the seven candlesticks, somebody's standing in the middle of them, and it looks like. <laughs> <laughs> it looks like the son of man looks like the son of man remember when the three Hebrew boys were in the fiery furnace and Nebuchadnezzar looked down in the fiery furnace he said did not we throw three men in the fiery furnace but I see a fourth man <laughs> and it looks like <laughs> 
<laughs> Amen. He says here, he says, he looks like the son of man. Now, when we look at son of man, now, according to the gospel, this is the title that Jesus gave himself in his humanity. Human flesh, the flesh. He called himself the son of man. And we know in the Old Testament, son of man was used. But Jesus called himself son of man. And throughout all four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Jesus called himself this 81 times. Son of man is used 81 times. The garment down to the foot is a priestly robe. And it's a robe of authority. This son of man is Jesus who is in the midst of the churches. Like I said, if the lamps were burning, it showed that Jesus was still in the churches. Amen. Amen. Now Christ was wearing the robe of a high priest. How John described him and said that he was clothed with a garment down to his foot and gird about the paps with a golden girdle that was the robe of the high priest, the number one, the one in charge, the high priest. John states that he was clothed in the garment down to his foot and he was girt about with the paps with a golden girdle. In the Old Testament, the high priest wore full length robes with a girdle made of fine linen embroidered with needlework secured around the waist. But in this vision, Christ had on the robe of a high priest but the girdle was not made of fine linen, it was made of gold, which also signified God. A amen. It signified dignity of an important office and signifies this office as our great high priest. The writer of Hebrews said in chapter 7, 24 and 25, but this man because he continued, he, he continued ever, have an unchangeable priesthood. What does it mean? It's saying that Jesus will be our high priest forever. In the Old Testament, the priest come, they died, somebody else came in instead, as long as they came through the bloodline of Aaron. But with Jesus, when Jesus became our high priest, there will be no more changing. He is our high priest forever. Amen. Wherefore, he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever live to make intercession for them. Jesus is our high priest. The vision that John saw, or I say it's a vision, but who John saw in the midst of those candlesticks was Jesus. He is our high priest. I think one, one writer said that he's the bishop of our souls. <laughs> Amen. Amen. The robe that he saw, it's the garment of the high priest. The golden sash across his chest completes the picture of Christ serving in his priestly robe. John sees Jesus in a body with a robe. Jesus is our high priest. It represents, he represents us before the father. Amen. Jesus says the only way that you're going to get to God, you got to come through me. Right. Back in the Old Testament, the job of the priest was to reconcile man back to God. And now who John is seeing here is someone in the role of a high priest, which is Jesus Christ, who reconciled us back to God. And how did Jesus do this? By, he, by dying on Calvary's hill. Amen. And he reconciled us back to God. Amen. His appearance in the churches would be as the son of man. In other words, Jesus would appear as a body as, in a body as man. And the purpose of the high priest was to take the sacrificial blood into the holy of holies. When they brought their sacrifices to the priest. The priest would get the sacrifices, he would kill it, he would get the blood, he would take it into the Holy of Holies behind the curtain, and he would sprinkle it on the mercy seat. He would sprinkle it on the Ark of the Covenant for an atonement of the sins of the people. That's sacrificial blood. It would, it would, it would be the sins of, it would, it would be the blood of animals that would cover or take away the sins of the people. Jesus did the same thing. 
When Jesus died on Calvary's hill, Jesus got his blood and took it before the Lord as an atonement for us. Now watch this. When he took his blood before the Lord, his blood did not cover our sins. Now y'all looking at me crazy now. His blood, the blood of Jesus, did not cover our sins. Hey, you wonder, you waiting to see what I'm going to say? Wait a minute, pal, hold up now. We're going to stay under the blood. The blood of Jesus did not cover our sins. Why? Because if something's covered up, that means it can be uncovered. So the blood of Jesus washed our sins away. It didn't just cover our sins up. The blood of Jesus took our sins away. What did John the Baptist say? Behold the Lamb of God that does what? Take it away. That's why he's our high priest. <laughs> because he took our sins away. Remember when those four friends brought their, brought their friend that was, had the palsy and they let him down. They tore up the roof of the house and they let him down to Jesus. And Jesus looked at him and said, your sins are forgiven. And the, and the Pharisees in their heart, they said, nobody can forgive sin but God. So Jesus showed them who he was. <laughs> he, said, he said, now to show you that the son of man has the power to forgive sin also. He said, would it be easier? <laughs> to say take up your bed and walk <laughs> all your sins are forgiven he said okay let me show you take up your bed and walk <laughs> so his blood as a high priest the blood his blood his precious blood that he shed on Calvary washed our sins away Because if you get in the habit of sweeping dirt under a rug, after a while, dust is going to start coming up from the rug. And it's going to be evidence that dirt is still there. But the blood of Jesus wiped our sins away. We have a clean slate and we have been forgiven of everything that we have done or everything we ever would do. We have an avenue to get back to God. Because he's our high priest. Hey, amen. Amen. This is the outer covering or his robe, his vesture, what he looked like to John. But if God's will, next week we'll talk about how he looked like, what he looked like underneath the robe. <laughs> hey, amen. Okay. Amen. Any questions, comments on verses 9 through 13? Any questions, comments? Yes, ma'am. Yes, yeah. You know, um, and, and even in Revelation, what I was hearing, even while you were teaching that, because I grew up as a child that was fearful of the book, too, because <laughs> people talk about that. Yeah, huh? Bible with Revelations much. Mm -hmm. But um, this is one of the first times in the beginning that I'm hearing the love.